Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. There's one FDA-approved peptide that mimics the actions of growth hormone-releasing hormone, and you guessed it by the title of this video, it's tesamorelin. It's clinically indicated for HIV-associated lipodystrophy, which is interesting and great due to the multifaceted detriments of dealing with chronic disease and its consequences. And the purpose of this video is to assess if any of the data translates to otherwise healthy individuals and naturally, what are the risks. Now, tesamorelin in and of itself is essentially just synthetic growth hormone releasing hormone or GHRH and it's got an added hexanoic acid functional group tagged along the end. GHRH itself consists of 44 amino acids and tesamorelin possesses all 44. In comparison to sermorelin for instance which is predominantly just the first 29. All of my regulars by now know about the GHRH axis for the newer subscribers and insomniacs who want to learn about peptides as a means of falling asleep. GHRH is a hypothalamic hormone that signals release of growth hormone itself from the anterior pituitary, which therein induces release of IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1 from the liver. And although these are the basics, it's also modulated by ghrelin's release from the stomach and somatostatin's diffuse stimulation via different physiologic pathways. There's a lot we don't know about this pathway, but those are truly the basics. Now why would we want to take a synthetic derivative of growth hormone releasing hormone? Good question, and it's one that some people claim to have the answer to and others do not. And I'm one of the ones who sits in the latter half, and you'll see peptide proponents telling you they'll make you bigger, faster, stronger, it's a fountain of youth, and honestly compounded by the fact that the growth hormone releasing hormone pathway is so under-researched, you won't hear me making those bold claims. I imagine that a child deficient in growth hormone production would benefit due to its growth stimulating properties in those who are growth hormone deficient, but other than that, it's really up in the air. That's not to say you'll experience absolutely not as popular anecdote says otherwise, but it is to say it cannot be predicted what you will experience, if anything at all. And I would never recommend somebody take these growth hormone stimulating peptides before achieving adequate understanding of not only the product's risks and benefits, but also the individual's own health, from baseline fasting blood glucose and HbA1c to comprehensive blood analyses and lipid levels. These are compounds that can increase insulin resistance, so controlling for that and metabolic risk factors is something that we can influence. On top of that, awareness of susceptibilities to cancers and keeping up with recommended screening and diagnostic tools alongside a doctor is important, as promoting growth is a characteristic feature of malignancy. Risk aversion is a tool to be utilized, especially when using these sorts of compounds. And I won't stay up on this soapbox for too long, but something that really bothers me about peptide media, which is a weird thing to say, is making all these claims about what benefits you'll achieve, since I would argue it's a bit irresponsible. Yes, we're all adults here and can make our own decisions based off research we do, and autonomy is something I find incredibly important. But as we've discussed before, there are virtually no consequences if these experimental peptide suppliers were to fudge their data about active ingredients and purity. Given production of these compounds is pretty much entirely underground, and even though there is this FDA ban on compounding, there's really minimal to no actual preventative measures taking place to ensure safe production, right? Like, best case scenario is you're getting pure tesamorelin. Worst case scenario, I'd rather not imagine. And I don't think that it's unlikely that people would likely be getting something somewhere in between completely pure and bathtub water. And yes, I'm being a bit exaggerative, but truly we never really know. It's why you don't see me jumping on these affiliate deals with peptide labs that are likely not even labs. But I digress. Let's talk about tesamorelin already. And if you haven't already and you enjoy this sort of content, hit that like and subscribe button. It goes a much longer way than you may think in helping a small peptide YouTuber like me. So Tesamorelin is FDA approved at a dose of 1.4 milligrams subcutaneously daily, hence why people recreating this dosing regimen find themselves spending an absurd amount of money. And there are a few predominant contraindications to its use, which we've touched on multiple times before and actually dove into some of the data surrounding these risks in the videos that will be linked in the description below. But these contraindications are disruption of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, active malignancy, or known hypersensitivity to tesamorelin, which is essentially one of a series of adverse reactions 
contributed to the drug itself. And some of the rightfully labeled limitations are that long-term cardiovascular safety hasn't been established, and that's not indicated for weight loss. You see a lot of YouTube videos out there saying these growth hormone-releasing peptides will help you increase lean body mass and gain muscle, and from what I can tell, only the former is possibly accurate, and it comes with a caveat. Growth hormone in an otherwise healthy person is shown to increase lean body mass, but it has not been determined whether it's due to increased musculature or water retention, the latter of which seems more likely, and E. Grifta's research actually points this out. And I've expressed my thoughts countless times on the quote-unquote idea of growth hormone replacement therapy, so no need to rehash the whole convo, but essentially crafting a risk-benefit analysis is confounded by the lack of research and concerns for adverse long-term effects with growth hormone augmentation. But the theory I possess is pretty much that growth hormone decline as we age is likely protective in nature, given correlative findings between growth hormone, IGF-1, and malignancy, as well as the likely decreased component of insulin sensitivity that comes with spiking growth hormone levels. And malignancy in general is more predominantly highlighted in Egrifta, or Tessamorelin's brand itself, due to the increased likelihood of developing certain cancers in patients with HIV. And with regards to lean body mass, fluid retention is not an uncommon concern with regards to GH and IGF-1 augmentation. And in clinical trials with Egrifta, there was a higher rate of development of insulin resistance with Tessamorelin than there was with those in the placebo group. Hence my disclaimer in the beginning about how this is not only not medical advice, but also that understanding baseline health is one of the key things we can do in tracking physiologic results and trending metabolic health. That's not to say these are definite results of administration, but we can say with confidence that they are legitimate concerns. That said, the most predominant reactions are more site-specific, as is unsurprising. These are rapid-forming, easily measurable, and legitimate concerns with every new compound or drug that somebody takes in one form or another. And as we discussed before, dating back to the earliest research on growth hormone-releasing peptides, and something that I really haven't seen discussed by anybody else, is that there's a popular component of immunogenicity, i.e. formation of antibodies against the peptide itself. And all the data surrounding it has really shown that yes, these antibodies are formed, but we don't really know how significant their formation is, in the sense that long-term results of developing antibodies against these peptides are unknown with regards to increased risk of certain adverse effects or efficacy itself. But I imagine that by getting a less pure source, i.e. getting an unprescribed one, I would logically have an increased fear of injecting foreign materials, things that aren't supposed to be there, things that are infectious in nature, or presence of more than expected ingredients right, whether it's an expected dose of an active pharmaceutical ingredient or other things that we're just not aware of because for the most part, this is truly unregulated. And in that case, perhaps adverse events are more likely, understandably so. That said, this is a quick review of the risks of tessamorelin administration. These are pretty much all the same adverse effects that you'd expect with peptides that increase growth hormone and IGF-1, but as the only GHRH analog with active FDA approval, and one that's popularly requested, I talk about, I did not want to do the disservice of ignoring it. So I hope you found this video helpful, entertaining. I didn't put you to sleep. Maybe I did, if that's what you're looking for. Regardless, thank you for watching. If you didn't already, hit that like, subscribe button. If you're interested in supporting the channel even further, submitting more frequent video requests, you can find the link to the Patreon in the description below. Most importantly, I hope you have a great day. Back to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy. He's your peptide buddy Cut to the chase, evidence based Pull up a chair, let's get this straight Peptide buddy